Many of you have been sending in your questions about COVID-19 to CBC News, and we want to help you answer them. So for that, we're joined now by CBC News medical contributor, Dr. Peter Lin. Dr. Lin, good to see you this morning, sir. Good to see you, Natasha. Okay, so let's begin with question number one. We're hearing lots of chatter about COVID-19 being airborne and about aerosol transmission. The World Health Organization says it will update its advice after hundreds of experts have already urged the agency to maybe reconsider the risk of aerosol spread. What do you make of that? Yeah, so basically we were told initially it was all by droplets, right? So that means somebody has to cough it out or sneeze it out and droplets fall off like at around two meters so that it can't go very far. And so that's why we all said, well, I wasn't near anybody that was sick looking and yet they still got sick. So now what we're saying is that they're saying that the virus could be just breathed out. And we know that there's asymptomatic people, people that don't have any symptoms. And because the virus is quite small, it could breathe it out and it creates a cloud. So think of somebody smoking. There's a lot of little particles that float around in that cloud. And so now you can get a cloud of this virus floating around in the air that can hang around for, let's say, a couple of minutes. Now, this now brings in a new thing. Yes, we want to stay apart. But if I'm sitting apart from you and I'm sitting there for a long period of time, I could breathe your cloud in. So now the time that you are exposed to each other becomes important and ventilation also becomes important. That's why outside there's a lot of airflow. That cloud doesn't crowd around you. So it's just like a person smoking outside. That white cloud doesn't stay. It gets blown away. So that's why outside is safer. But in a closed environment inside, you could imagine somebody smoking inside, that cloud would stay. That's the same idea that we have once this thing is now quoted as being airborne, that that cloud can hang around. Mask will help, but if I sit right next to you for eight hours, let's say I'm at work and I sit next to you for eight hours, I might still be able to breathe that virus in because now it can hang around in the air. You know, Dr. Lin, you're, you're talking about work being next to people for a long period of time. And if this thing is airborne, then we've got another issue. But earlier today, I was speaking with a mom. They're going to a rally. They want schools to reopen. They want their kids to go back. Having that structure, which naturally lots of people can understand. People want to go back to university and colleges. But if it's possibly moving through the ventilation systems, through air conditioning, closed spaces not so good, then is this perhaps going to be an even bigger problem uh, when we hit the fall? Yes, and that's why it's good that they're making these uh, uh, the recommendations now because now that it's airborne, we have to think about different things. Yes, we want the students to be apart, but now we're talking about the timing. Should we be keeping them together for six hours at a time? In other words, the duration of time is important. And as you were saying, the air flow. So it's not so much that it's going to be found every little space in the duct area. But what about if we have these window air conditioner units in some of the older schools where they're blowing the wind across horizontally? So now you could pass the virus from one child to the next if we're blowing horizontally. And there was a case in China where it was in a restaurant. The person that was sick was at one table near the air conditioning unit. And the other person sitting at another table, almost like five meters away, got sick because the airflow pushed that virus across. So now that it's airborne, we now have to think about airflow within the classroom, for example. So yes, the students are gonna be apart, but now we have to think about how long they should be hanging together. And number two is how do we get the airflow so that it's either going up or down, but not across people's faces. So that way we don't pass the virus from one person to another. Okay, uh, let's stick with the school subject because we have a question from one of our viewers, Amanda, and she wants to know if schools in Ontario reopen in September, uh, there are sure to be new coronavirus cases cropping up. If a child or teacher tests positive, what does that mean for the families of all the other children in that class? Yeah, good question, because this is where contact tracing is going to be like on super alert. So basically, if one child has it, let's say, then it's all the students around that particular child who are their friends that he hangs around with or she hangs around with. And then those families would be contacted. And so public health is going to be uh, very vigilant in terms of contact tracing to make sure that they contain it. Uh, so there will be some pop ups of these hot spots. And therefore, we have to make sure and teach your children about physical distancing and everything else. And I think those things are also important. But definitely there will be cases, but public health will do the contact tracing just like they do right now. But it'll be within the school system that they're going to contact people that then will isolate or get tested. Uh, and probably both things will happen as well. You know, uh, Dr. Lin, during the commercial break, you and I were talking about how we're learning as we go. And previously we thought it was just uh, air droplets. Now it's potentially it's aerosol before it was you don't need to wear a mask. No, now definitely everybody wear a mask. And I wonder 
so far, the common knowledge has been that it doesn't really hurt children that much. What are we going to do if in a few months we realize, oh, the way it impacts children is that it's way down the line? Do we know enough at this stage to be telling children, yes, go back to school? Yeah, so that's the concern. But on the other hand, we do want to have children going back to school in terms of structure. It allows the parents to get back to work. So we do want to get people back to school. The key thing is how do we make it safely? Just because they're lower risk of dying, it doesn't mean that kids have not died or had complications. They're just at lower risk of it compared to, let's say, a senior person. Uh, but definitely they do get sick. And so that's why we're trying to do everything in our power um, to make sure that we don't put children in harm's way. And we also don't want them to bring it back to their families because kids, about 50 percent, are asymptomatic. They're one of those groups of, uh, of uh, patients where they don't show any symptoms, but they can carry the virus back home to grandparents and things like that. So I think everybody does want to get it right. And now that we know that it is airborne, we could take more steps and more precautions to make sure that the children don't get sick. Okay, uh, we've got a question from Sue Klein-Smith. She wants to know how risky it is to go back into the malls. Yeah, so the mall is another closed environment and it gets quite crowded. So I would tell people, uh, pick times that are less busy. So go in the, the early mornings and so on and so forth. And number two is instead of hanging around in the mall, just go in and do whatever you need to do and get back out. And again, stay away from other people. Uh, in, in other words, the physical distancing, wearing your mask and things like that. I think the highest risk, as we saw in the United States, would be a bar or a nightclub, for example, where people are very close to each other. They've got their masks off because they're either eating or drinking. And there's a lot of you know loud talking, right? Because uh, there's a lot of music and things like that. And so therefore, the loud talking, and then perhaps with alcohol, people forget about the physical distancing. So that would be the highest risk. But in a mall, at least you can control timing and the crowds that you're going around. And that would be very helpful for you to go there. Oh, my gosh. Loud talking. I didn't even think about that. And I'm such a loud talker. OK. And so we've got one more viewer question, Dr. Lin. This one comes from Christina. She wants to know uh, about how safe it is to ride elevators in a city like Toronto. Yeah, it's tough. So elevator is another closed environment. So therefore, they limit the number of people uh, going up and down. So be patient. And number two is we tell people to face away from each other. So in other words, don't breathe the same cloud that the other person is doing. Everybody will have masks on. The masks will decrease the cloud. So in other words, you can't get the virus as far out because the wind power is stopped by the mask. Uh, and then one thing I've told people is just hold your breath. I know this sounds silly, but just hold your breath uh, because when you don't breathe in, then the virus can't come into your body. So if it's a very long elevator ride, just breathe slower. So instead of taking 30 breaths, just take three breaths. And then that way, you're not, your chances of breathing it in is smaller. And that's the same thing I tell people in closed environments. Like, let's say you're going to the bathroom and there's only one hallway and somebody's coming towards you. Then just hold your breath for those five seconds as you cross. And that way, the virus is not moving at that time, so you can't breathe it in. So if you get into a close environment, just hold your breath. That way, you cannot breathe in the virus. I don't have a scientific paper to prove that, but it's just something easy that we can all do. And then that way, we don't freak out when we see somebody uh, walking down the hall towards us. Okay, I'm just going to stay home. Dr. Yeah. Lin, <laughs> thank you so much, sir. Always good to chat with you. Thanks, Natasha. Dr. Peter Lin is CBC News' medical contributor.